Hello everyone and welcome to this next video in mine and Mr Messenger's series of videos on the power and conflict poems that you're studying for your English Literature GCSE. This next video is going to explore Carol Rumin's poem The Emigre um, and we'll start off with a little bit of thinking about the framework and the context that it sits in um, and introduce you to some of the key ideas before we look more closely in detail at the poem. And firstly, um, we just need to acknowledge where this poem comes from because poems are published in collections that have a broader basis and set of themes. And this one was published in Thinking of Skins. And that idea of skins is a really interesting one to think about when we consider this poem. That this is a poem that considers and thinks about and comments on people's national identities and how our identities are formed. And it perhaps takes this idea of our skins being a container for our identities and if we take that as a starting point this does help to make sense of some of the metaphors, issues, ideas and images that happen and occur and are used throughout this poem. Um, and then we can just take the title of this poem, perhaps another skin. Uh, it's called the emigre which is just a word for someone who leaves one country and travels to another um, and this, in this sense the poetic voice the speaker of the poem, is this voice that doesn't have a named place, a name, a background, an identity. And indeed, Rumens gives us a speaker and a poetic voice who doesn't have a named city where they come from. Instead, Rumens seems to be giving us a poem that is as universal as it's possible to be, is as universal a comment on migration, perhaps forced migration, which has become one of the defining issues of the 21st century and certainly one of the most divisive issues in the 21st century. And certainly, perhaps then, we can see this poem as a commentary on the mass migration of people as they flee civil wars, as they rage around the world. And by adopting this universal approach, it becomes even more relevant today and to today's readers in today's world right now. So with that in mind, and that universal context in place, the unnamed city with the unnamed speaker with an unnamed background, we can also consider that this is perhaps an innocent voice caught in the middle of conflict, caught in the middle of situations that are dangerous and terrifying and threatening. Um, and this allows Rumens to introduce us to a speaker who has these vague ghost-like memories of her past or his past, and to give us a sense of a cultural identity that has been lost, or certainly is only half remembered. The poem in that sense then is nostalgic. The poem balances looking at tyrants and a country sick with tyrants at the same time as the city being remembered as white and gleaming. And there is this tension between the two things, between the fear and terror of a country governed by a dictator or governed under a dictatorship, but equally a nostalgic, positive look back at a history that is half remembered. These beautiful, pristine white buildings being an example of this. And certainly then, as the poem moves on, it moves away from being a poem about migration and the process of migration and some of the issues that come with that but instead becomes increasingly ambiguous and the poem becomes intensely metaphorical instead. Language becomes a metaphor. The city named becomes a metaphor. The Russian doll in the middle stanza of this poem again becomes a metaphor. And equally the passport, a vivid and politically charged symbol, particularly today, is another metaphor that Rumens uses to develop a range of meaning as the poem continues. And that sense of passporting, of moving from one place to another, in theory a passport gives you freedom to move between borders and over borders, but by the same token we have a poetic voice who can no longer return to and access their old lost memories. And that's the tension that this poem explores, and I'll come back to that again. It's that tension between what's been lost and the nostalgia, between the nostalgia and the fear and the terror of perhaps a country or a city that's governed by a tyrant. So now let's look more closely at the poem and the range of meanings and ideas that she runs all the way through this poem. Okay, so now let's look closely at the language and the structure of the emigre, but we'll read the poem first of all. The emigre. 
there once was a country. I left it as a child, but my memory of it is sunlight clear, for it seems I never saw it in that November, which, I am told, comes to the mildest city. The worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view, the bright, filled paperweight. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants, but I am branded by an impression of sunlight. The white streets of that city, the graceful slopes glow even clearer as time rolls its tanks and the frontiers rise between us, close like waves. The at child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll opens and spills a grammar. Soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it. It may by now be a lie, banned by the state, but I can't get it off my tongue. It tastes of sunlight. I have no passport. There's no way back at all. But my city comes to me in its own white plain. It lies down in front of me, docile as paper. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls. They accuse me of absence. They circle me. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. My city hides behind me. They mutter death and my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. Okay, let's start with this opening line. There once was a country. And we begin with this childlike fairy tale reminiscence. And it, we have that opening starting point as though it's some kind of fiction as though it has been lost, it's half remembered, it's like a story passed down and perhaps this is a comment that conflict is destructive and interrupts normal succession. And that's further reinforced because we have that word child straight away. And like in Blake's poem, London, the child should be innocent. And they should be free. They shouldn't have to suffer or struggle in any way, shape or form. Um, but we do get straight away this image of sunlight, the, of its sunlight clear. The impression of sunlight branding the memory of the speaker of the poetic voice and at the end of the poem sunlight at the end of the second stanza sunlight so we have this repeated motif of sunlight through the poem so we can trace this through and at the end of each stanza we have that same image again so this symbolizes that despite destruction, her memory of the old city and identity can't be taken away. In that sense, war cannot repress or taint memory and tyrants ultimately can't stop your identity or change it. So even though tyrants exist, their, te their power is only ever going to be temporary. And indeed, that impression is brought through even more strongly at this early stage of the poem, because we have this metaphor of being branded by an impression of sunlight. So to brand something is to burn it into a material. So this is a permanent mark. It is indelible. And we'll just annotate on there that it's a metaphor as well, that the old identity can't be erased 
or altered or lost. So that comes through very strongly and that's established in the first stanza. The first stanza marks that this identity can never be stripped away, can never be taken. And we have that positive, constructive reminiscence, this nostalgic presence in the opening of the poem. And indeed, we have this in the mildest city and the white streets with their graceful slopes that glow. So we have this positive nostalgia that is unchanged by the presence of tyrants, dictators, or the process of tyranny itself. And this verb glow, which we'll just highlight here, means that this memory shines out like sunlight. And in that sense, then, beauty and freedom shine and glow in contrast and in opposition to repression. However, this is placed in contrast with the personification. The whole country is personified to be in this city to be sick with tyrants. And that tyranny is an illness. We must label this personification as well. It harms, it destroys, it ruins. So we have that, despite the nostalgic impression, despite the positive memories, the presence of the tyrant, the presence of this restrictive force of rulers who will not give people their freedom, places this in contrast. And we do have a binary opposition between nostalgia and tyranny through this poem. And that nowhere is that really captured more clearly in just this first and earlier image of the city that she remembers being captured and seen in a paperweight. So I imagine this to be an image and a symbol. And it's a city, but captured in glass. And it's almost a toy. It's almost a child's vision and memory of a past experience. And it's that childlike vision that is permanent, that is marked, that can't be lost and has been held in place. So as we just move down and through the poem, we can move into this second stanza. Um, and in this second stanza, um, we start to see more of those barriers come up. We talk about the frontiers rise between us. Um, and this metaphor really strongly articulates the sense of there being barriers thrown up between countries. The blockages. Um, and that countries become isolated and separated. But even more so, the poetic voice has become dislocated from her own cultural identity as a result of this. And this traces down and through to this symbol, which I mentioned in the introduction of having no passport. So she has no access to her old country. And that means symbolically she has no access to her old identity. And that's been taken from her. Because to have your own cultural identity is a right. And that is something that is yours and it should be yours by right. And she's had that denied to her. 
but again, this balance between the serious and the playful, the, the nostalgic and the repression is played through as we move and we start looking at this at the lang at language. So we talk about the child's vocabulary, it in the simile being like a hollow doll that opens and spills a grammar. And it is this child's language. It's a simple vision of the world. But also that it's somehow hollow. This child's vocabulary, it's empty. That there has been this lost identity because her language has been lost. And indeed, when we have this verb spills, that when it's remembered, it tumbles out in an uncontrolled way. But this simile develops in the next line and it continues in the next line because Rumins has her poetic speaker, her poetic voice talks about colouring every molecule of it. So there is a determination to rediscover the lost identity and fill it in again. And with that, we equally get in this poem within a collection of power as well as conflict a rebellion against something that's been banned by the state so to rediscover identity is to rebel against tyranny and that's hopeful because there doesn't seem to be an end to it and indeed that she can't get it off my tongue much like being branded by sunlight earlier, up here, it's permanent, it's indelible, it can't be removed. And then as we come on to the final stanza, we've already commented on the really important symbol of having no passport. But equally, we get the quite beautiful image of the plain. But my city comes to me in its own white plain, it lies down in front of me docile as paper. So it's almost as though the rediscovery is involuntary. That your cultural identity is inherent. It's a natural part of you. That it can't be repressed. And access to it can't be denied. And then, and particularly bearing in mind that the poem started with a maternal image, or sorry, a childlike image, now we have a maternal image to my eye. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. So instead, we have this movement to a maternal image. Having started with a childlike nostalgia. And that is a significant progression because this progression represents a growing rediscovery of identity. So the poetic voice that Rumens crafts is going through this process and this progress of rediscovering identity. And as we move through the final, final stanza, they, we have this somewhat negative image coming in again, and Rumens keeps this balance all the way through her poem, that those who remain accuse me of absence, they circle me, they accuse me of being dark in their free city. 
So we have this, and this is a really ambiguous pair of lines, but we do have the sense here of this cultural confusion, perhaps. And what do we see in society today? Well, we see that being criticised all the time, and it comes up again and again and again. Um, and the, the this idea of being circled and entrapped um, when they should be free and at liberty. So perhaps the world that she finds herself in, this poetic voice, this speaker that Rumens has crafted and Rumens has created, has moved from one explicit type of tyranny to a more implicit type of tyranny. However, despite this apparently negative impression, we do finish with one final positive and striking image because we finish on sunlight. But she has a shadow that is evidence of sunlight. Sunlight, I think, in this poem signals freedom and access to identity. You can't be denied a shadow. So no act of oppression can limit the individual. And despite it being a tense final line, a line where the they, these unnamed presences, are muttering death, that despite the attempts to repress, despite the attempts to control, ultimately it can't be. An identity cannot be repressed and it cannot be controlled because the shadow inevitably falls because and that remains evidence of sunlight. Sunlight that acts as freedom. So we've looked at the language, the meaning, the representations in the poem, and I just wanted to pause and just take a moment to have a look at some of the structure of this poem as well. So I'm going to just do this in pink. And I particularly wanted to draw your attention to the lineation of this poem. So we have quite a number of enjambed lines. Okay, lines where there's no period piece of punctuation at the end, where the meaning just carries on over. So we can add a comment here, and I would focus this in on a particular moment, but this enjambment could be said to represent the way memory and identity can't be constrained or limited. But equally, there are many lines that are disrupted in this poem as well. We have in here, it may be at war, and then your caesura, it may be sick with tyrants. So there is still the disruption of repression and the limits that are imposed. And indeed, right at the very, very start of the poem, the ellipsis, there once was a country, dot, 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 ellipsis, I left it as a child. We have the break with this caesura. We have it fragments, have the line fragment, and this is like memory being fragmented as a result of this tyranny. Um, and then as we move towards the end of the poem, as we move down here to the final stanza, we see more of that lineation come back again. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls, Caesura. They accuse me of absence, Caesura, and then an end stop. They accuse me of being dark in their free city, end stop. This is highly fragmented in a poem that is so full of enjambment, so full of lines that flow from one to another. So if we just zoom right in here, this fragmentation intensifies and it is perhaps Rumin's offering a warning that tyranny and repression are always close 
and perhaps that they must always be resisted. Best stressed through that symbol of sunlight. So that should bring us to the end of our uh, examination of this poem and the exploration of this poem. As you can see, it is a poem dense in technique and language and it's interesting in terms of the way it's structured and it clearly develops a huge range of meaning. You could go on and take this further now, explode quotations just like I've modelled to you in earlier videos. I would take four or five from this poem. You could go away and consider the other political issues that Rumin's poem could be applied to. Uh, as this poem was written quite a few years ago now, but there are political issues that it could refer to right now and commentary that it could offer right now. And moreover, you can go on and comment on the kind of um, personal context that it might offer. Questions about identity and national identity and what the emigre might have to say to us today as well.